left off in the last video going over the different layers and accessory structures found in the integumentary system or in the skin. So when we talked about the layers, we had the epidermis, which is this outer layer here. Now, since there's no blood supply directly to the epidermis, then the epidermis really has one primary function, which is protection. We have lots of layers of flat dead cells. So what type of epithelium would that be? That would be stratified squamous epithelium. Now the dermis, this kind of middle layer here, here, is going to have all the other functions of skin. So it's going to produce hair, nails, oil, sweat, and so on. It's going to have all the sensory structures that are in skin. We're also here going to find connective tissue helping to provide some structure and anchoring and support to this tissue. And a lot of collagen and elastic fibers. In the subcutaneous or hypodermic layer, we're technically below the skin at this point. So this is sort of an insulating layer where we're gonna have some areolar tissue, but also a lot of adipose tissue. Now this is going to vary from person to person. In general, individuals with testes tend to put adipose around their abdominal organs when they have excess calories, whereas individuals with ovaries tend to put that excess adipose underneath the skin. This is where I'm going to have my larger blood vessels. So we went over the basic structures of skin and the ones that you should be able to identify on a model or an image. If we just peel back the epidermis, so just this outer layer here, we can actually subdivide that into even more layers. At the very bottom, kind of following these papilla, we're going to have the stratum basale, or we can call the stratum germinativum. This is where I'm going to have rapidly dividing cells. And this is where I'm going to also have my melanocytes, which we will talk about more in just a couple minutes. So these cells are rapidly dividing and as they're moving outwards, they're filling up with a protein called keratin and dying. By the time we get to this outermost layer, the stratum corneum, these are all flat, dead, keratinized cells. So they're just full of that protein keratin which helps to provide protection and also waterproofing. Now, you can have thin skin or thick skin. Certain areas of the body may have thicker skin, and in those areas you will also have a stratum lucidum. So this is an extra layer of dead skin or of dead cells found only in thick skin. So you would have a stratum lucidum in places maybe like the palms of your hands, possibly your elbows if you're resting those on tables or desks all the time, possibly your knees if you're a toddler or an infant and you're just crawling, so you may have a lot of abrasion on your knees and build up calluses there, and certainly the bottom of your feet. So wherever you have thicker skin, then you're going to have this lucidum layer. There were some other layers of the skin that they talked about in the other video, like the spinosum and the granulosum, but basically those are layers that are kind of filling up with this keratin as they're moving outwards and then dying. Now this might 
make you wonder about these terms down here. What would be the difference between a basal cell carcinoma and a melanoma? Well, a basal cell carcinoma would be cancer of those cells in the basale, those stem cells. A melanoma would be cancer specifically of the melanocytes. So a basal cell carcinoma will tend to blend in more with the other skin around it, so it will have a similar color, whereas melanocytes produce brownish pigment, so those kind of tumors that form would end up being really dark and obvious. We mentioned before the accessory structures of skin that originate typically in the dermis or the hypodermis. So you have your hair follicles where you're growing the hair, nails, and then the different glands like sweat glands and sebaceous glands. And we also have all of your skin receptors as well. If these accessory structures can be kept intact because of an injury or a burn, then typically you can regenerate that dermis. If all of those accessory structures are lost, however, then you're going to have, not be able to do that. Now you don't have to know all the different parts of a nail, but they are accessory structures of the skin and they're somewhat similar to hair in the sense that if we go all the way back down here, kind of to this area of where the nail originates, it's very much like the root of a hair. So if you were to tear or cut your nail off, even right up to where that cuticle is, you can still regrow a nail as long as you still have those cells intact. Now the hair follicle is going to be again where the hair is developing. Color in the hair is due to what type of melanin you have and how much melanin you put down. And then, as we mentioned before, the erector pili muscle is what's going to make those hairs stand up so that you can trap air close to the surface of the skin. There are some regions of the body that you do not have hair present. So you typically do not have hair on your palms, the soles of your feet, uh, lips, nipples, and other external reproductive organs. Now the sebaceous glands, we talked about those before, they're often associated with hair follicles. They produce a substance called sebum, which is kind of a fatty material, but also has kind of broken down cells and bits of debris in there. It's going to help to keep that skin intact, so it keeps it kind of soft and, and waterproofed, which is why if you're washing your hands constantly, like you might do during, let's say, a pandemic, then you're also washing off a lot of that oil, which is preventing the skin from staying nice and soft, and you can get dry skin and it can get cracked. However, if you have too much sebum, or if you get inflammation and irritation of those sebaceous glands, then you can get acne. And like hair, you don't see these on the palms or soles of your feet. Now we mentioned before that there are some different kinds of sweat glands. So these are sudoriferous glands. They're found all over the skin in general. You have two main types of sweat glands. You have eccrine sweat glands, which are also called merocrine glands or apocrine glands. Now the eccrine glands are what we think of as clean sweat. These are the glands that are primarily trying to cool you down. So they're producing this kind of clean sweat that evaporates and cools the body. These are generally the only types of sweat glands that you have that are really functional in a young child. When a child starts to go through puberty, then they start to produce these apocrine sweat glands, which kind of produce the stinky sweat. So these are generally found in your axillary region, which if you remember is your armpit or the groin region or inguinal region. And these glands often respond to emotion or pain and produce um, sweat that is a different consistency and the bacteria feed on that sweat and then that produces those kind of noxious fumes. There are ceraminous glands 
Those are going to be specifically in the ear canal, so they're producing earwax. And then we have mammary glands, which are producing milk. Now let's talk for a minute about melanocytes. We said that they're found in this stratum basale layer. So the very bottom of the epidermis. Now unlike these keratinocytes that kind of migrate outwards and die, melanocytes stay put. But what they do is they deposit little pigment molecules in the cells as those cells are migrating outwards. Now the amount of melanin that these cells put into these keratinocytes as they move outwards is going to depend on a couple of things. It's obviously going to depend on your genetics, and we'll look at that in a minute. And of course it also depends on exposure to light. Now what's really interesting about these guys is that all of us have about the same number of melanocytes per square inch on our skin. So for example, the difference between me and somebody like Holly Berry or Michelle Obama, other than the fact that they're probably a lot smarter than me, is that their skin has the same number of melanocytes on as mine, but their melanocytes are working really hard and producing a lot of this pigment called melanin. My melanocytes are like those people sitting on the side of the road that should be doing work, but they're just always on break. Now I'm not saying anything about people who work on roads. Many of them work very, very hard. But you know there's that one crew somewhere and they're always on a lunch break. Those are mine. And then if I expose them to UV light, that should stimulate them to get back to work. Mine just like to flip me off. So. I tend to go translucent in the winter, um, briefly sunburn, back to translucent. So that's about it. I do occasionally get what looks like a tan, but it's really just a whole bunch of freckles that fuse together. So the way melanin works is that as these light rays are coming in, if that light can get all the way to my stem cells in that basale layer, they could damage the DNA and potentially these cells could become cancerous. They start to divide out of control. Because if I damage the right genes, I could damage the oncogenes or the tumor suppressing genes that we talked about a while ago. But if as this light is coming in, it runs into some dark pigment molecules, it may get absorbed by those pigment molecules and therefore never make it down to these stem cells. Kind of like if you go on vacation to Florida and you rent a car, you want them to give you a white car versus a car that's very dark because the dark car is going to absorb more light and it's going to be hotter than the white car which reflects a lot of the light. So melanin helps to protect those underlying stem cells by absorbing light as it comes in. Now melanin isn't the only thing that affects skin color. So we have melanin, which we said gives that kind of brownish color. But then we also have hemoglobin, which probably gives me most of my skin color because that's found in my blood and is going to give kind of a red or pink color to skin. So if you have a sunburn, if you have inflammation and the skin is red or you're blushing, whatever that pink tint is, that's just because of the underlying blood underneath that skin. The last one is something called carotene. Carotene is something that you would get in your diet, maybe when you eat carrots or squash, something with an orangish pigment to it, and it's going to give me kind of an orange or a yellow tint to the skin. And it's not that uncommon that you can get new parents who have an infant that is now six, month old, six months old and they're starting to eat solid foods 
and they only really like sweet foods like um, sweet potatoes or carrots or things like that. So the parents keep feeding them the food that they'll eat, thinking, well, it's a vegetable, it's good for them, which is true. But if that's the only real solid food they're eating and then the rest is milk, then they start to store some of this carotene in the skin, and the next thing you know, you have a little Oompa Loompa. So they have to basically either stop feeding them so many orange foods or just keep offering other types of foods. Eventually that infant is going to start eating other things and the skin that has turned orangish is going to slough off and they're going to go back to whatever their normal color is. Now there are some other things that can affect skin color. There are environmental factors and we talked about light exposure as one, stimulating more melanin production. But we can have other skin colors like cyanosis or jaundice. Cyanosis is when you get a bluish tint to the skin and it's due to decreased oxygen in the blood. So this can happen because somebody's lung function is decreased. It could be because they are having difficulty doing gas exchange in the lungs. So maybe you have a newborn baby and their lungs aren't fully developed yet when they're born because they were premature. Then they might have that kind of bluish tint to the skin. Jaundice is when you get an kind of an orangish, yellowish kind of color to the skin. And it's due to a bilirubin buildup in the blood. Now, the reason that happens is your liver breaks down the parts of the hemoglobin that were used by red blood cells. So when red blood cells die, your liver helps to break down these hemoglobin molecules and one of the byproducts is bilirubin, which has kind of a yellowish color to it. The problem is if somebody's going through liver failure, then that bilirubin isn't getting kind of broken down further and dumped out in bile, and you end up getting a buildup of that in the bloodstream. So you end up getting this kind of jaundiced, yellowish look. Um, for some people, it shows up in the eyes, like the whites of the eyes start to turn yellow. And I can tell you from experience, when I was watching my father at the end of his uh, battle with pancreatic cancer, he started to go through liver failure because tumors had formed in his liver. And it is a very distinct, impossible to miss color. It really looked like somebody had just painted him with betadine, which is the stuff they might paint over part of your body before surgery to disinfect it. It's really, really dramatic and it would change from day to day depending on how well his liver was functioning. So we mentioned genetics. So if we look, there are actually three genes, one, two, three genes, that determine the main amount of melanin that you make in the skin. And you got one copy of that gene from your mom and one copy from your dad and one of the next one from mom and one of the next one from dad and so on with the third gene. So depending on how many of those genes are dominant or kind of turned on is going to depend and determine how much melanin you produce. So if none of them are dominant, then you have very pale skin. And if all of them are dominant, then you have the darkest skin. And then you can have any combination in between. So there's really only three genes that are setting that primary skin tone. And then as we mentioned, there are other things that can affect it. You can have somebody who doesn't have the ability to make melanin at all and they would be an albino or they would have something called albinism. We talked about sunlight, we talked about food, your blood, 
And then we talked about lack of oxygen or buildup of waste products. There are lots of different skin color disorders. Vitiligo is one where you have patchiness in melanin production in the skin. So here's a picture over here of a model, and I'm drawing a blank on her name at the moment, um, who has vitiligo. And Michael Jackson also had vitiligo, so he started to have this kind of patchwork of melanin loss on his skin. Now we mentioned that the skin plays a role in vitamin D production. So your skin is going to make this vitamin D, your liver and your kidneys are going to convert that into something called calcitriol, and that's going to be really, really important for absorption of calcium in the diet. So that's why if you take calcium supplements, a lot of times they have vitamin D in them, because if you don't have enough vitamin D, maybe you don't get sun exposure in the winter because you live up north and you're all bundled up when you go outside, then if you eat things with calcium in them, it's just going to go right out the other end of the donut hole if you don't have vitamin D there to help you absorb it. So if I'm insufficient in vitamin D, I can get something called rickets because of that calcium deficiency. And we can think about where globally this might be a problem. And really it would be anywhere where individuals are completely covered and don't get enough sun exposure. So you can imagine that in certain cultures where they are completely covered when they go outside, or just think about people living in regions where it's very cold. Again, you might not expose your face or your hands or anything to the sun when you go outside because it's just too cold. So even living in Michigan, you want to be taking calcium supplements with vitamin D in the winter because you're not likely getting enough sun exposure. Now I mentioned earlier the dangers of tanning beds and I said that I would show you a picture to illustrate this. This is a young woman, Tawny Willoughby, who was a frequent teenage tanner as a teenager and she ended up getting skin cancer at 21 and she posted images of her when she was tanning and then when she had the skin cancer because she really wanted all other young people to see what kind of damage that does to the skin and how it's just not worth getting that brown color. For some reason in our society we tend to equate that kind of tan look, that brownish color to someone who's healthier, but in reality it means there's damage to the skin. All right, we'll stop there and we'll come back and talk about a couple more things to finish off integument.